Um, welcome to um, another uh, uh, Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan professional luncheon, I would like to say, but actually it's more like a reunion. So, uh, and uh, someone has asked me a question, which is, what is the excuse for this gathering of uh, four uh, former members here? And uh, the excuse is that uh, it's over the last 10 years, we have gathered, we have met, uh, uh, including, of course, David Watts, who is un not able to come today because of uh, illness, but, and also um, Hugh Sandeman, another former uh, correspondent who uh, was here in the 80s uh, with The Economist is also unable to come, but uh, this group has gathered in, uh, uh, usually in the hometowns or uh, some town significant to the careers of these members. And one of the towns, one of the places we went to was, was Lisbon, where the local um, uh, political newspaper headlined our arrival as Antigos Correspondents, and which means, of course, that we are the antique correspondents. And so since then, we've called ourselves the antiques. And um, I just want to say that uh, these four of our guests have all gone on to greater things after leaving uh, Tokyo, uh, mostly in the 80s, but uh, Philippe in 2000. Um, you will recognize that Bill, uh, was the man who predicted the collapse of the Japanese economy, and he's still accurate because it is still continuing to do so. Uh, he did this in 1989 or 19, a few months before actually the bubble burst. Uh, then uh, uh, William Horsley is now uh, representing uh, uh, the European uh, Association of Journalists. I can't remember the precise title, but uh, on uh, journalism, on safety of journalists and has written extensively on all the horrible things that can happen to our colleagues and, 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 and does. And uh, Fernando Mezzetti, uh, after leaving La Stampa, wrote several monumental works, including uh, one 600-page tome called From Mao to Dung, uh, about, the, uh, about how China reinvented itself as a, uh, a, um, a market economy. And Philippe here, who uh, is disguised as an olive farmer uh, because he actually does own an, 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 you know, a very uh, splendid olive grove in, uh, in Portugal, but who is also at the same time uh, an active journalist working for a, um, a French online uh, uh, news journal called Media Part, about which he will tell you. And some of you will also recognize him as the person who made um, it possible for Carlos Ghosn to tell his story in several languages, right? Okay, and at the same time, I'd also like to welcome John Harris, who is in our audience, who was here in the 1980s, as he was uh, the late uh, Bruce Dunning's uh, producer, uh, and he went on to Miami and London, uh, and I also would like to welcome uh, uh, Murakami Sensei's guests, I mean, who uh, students from Temple University, uh, Sarai, Priscilla, and Richard, right? who are uh, embarking, who think that they will have a career in journalism, and we wish them luck. Uh, and not because they're, they, they have um, a high opinion of themselves, but because, uh, because uh, journalism is such a, a staggeringly difficult place to get into these days and to make a living, and we wish them well. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let me uh, pass on the uh, mic to, in alphabetical order, to Bill who will talk about an issue of concern to him with regard to journalism, and that is the whole idea of this gathering today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Andrew, and uh, thank you all for uh, taking time from your busy schedules to be here. It's a great honor to be here as the uh, first museum piece um, from the uh, Foreign Correspondents Club uh, archive that uh, we represent uh, here on the top table. Um, and especially in this uh, noble room in which all of us have spent so many memorable uh, times. I particularly want to mention that some things never change because I remember being in this room, uh, listening to a talk by uh, the present Prime Minister's father when he was Foreign Minister, at the end of which the uh, International Press Secretary for uh, Abe Shintaro 
approached our moderator, Andrew Horvat, and in his typical diplomatic skill said, ah, Mr. Horvat, I see you're still asking the same stupid questions. <laughs> so some elements of uh, contact with the media um, don't change, but perhaps the tactics do. Um, I want to just say a few words about uh, the, the way in which parochialism, the uh, sense of local uh, obsession, uh, persists so strongly in, despite the global information age that has, of course, developed since uh, we were all here as correspondents, which is by way of saying how important the role of the foreign correspondent is uh, and re remains, and if anything, more important. What has changed since we, we were here? Well, yes, the world has become more transparent. We face more competition in the provision of information. It is harder for politicians and other power holders to say different things to different audiences at home and abroad, as was common in the uh, 1980s. But some things have definitely either stayed the same or even gone backwards. All politics are still local, as Tip O'Neill said. And I think, if anything, the media, for whom many of us work or contribute, have become even more local than before. Europe, where I live now, has had a series of crises over the past five years. The Euro currency crisis and associated uh, economic crisis, the crisis of Russia and Ukraine, and essentially a, an invasion on the borders of the European Union, and most lately the migration crisis, the refugee crisis, around the Mediterranean, all of which were crises that naturally demanded coverage and thinking that crosses borders, that looked at experiences shared between countries, that was not national but rather looking at the common experiences. And yet, in Europe, in that time, our media has, if anything, become more nationalistic, more na nation-centered, and far too little cross-border cross-cultural reporting and analysis has happened. Why is this? Well, it is because of the result of the financial crisis of 2008 that has increased the level of fear and decreased a certain sense of, of confidence in our systems, but also that um, has, of course, put our own media under great economic pressure as well, even beyond the pressure that the that digital uh, technology would have done. Most of all now, I think we should recognize that the open society itself is under great threat all around the world. The open society that has enabled us to thrive uh, and develop so many new ideas and new technologies and new uh, understandings of each other since uh, the 1950s, it's under threat from rising xenophobia, nationalism, seen in attitudes to migration, but also to trade, to security, uh, to religions, seen in Europe in the form of Marine Le Pen, of Viktor Orban in Andrew's country, uh, in Nigel Farage, and many conservative Eurosceptics in my country, and above all, of course, by Donald Trump. The open society is something that we foreign correspondents, I believe, uh, uh, um, epitomize. And this threat to openness is what I think makes foreign correspondents more important than ever. Um, we are agents of awareness. The interplay of ideas and experiences that, uh, that have educated uh, the world so much, we provide a crucial context an analytical context that is necessary even more, even if information now flows um, better uh, than before. So really, to the point of us as foreign correspondents has always been that to understand other countries is to understand better your own. This craft, this necessity is under attack, and we must defend it. I will stop there.
Thank you very much, Bill, for uh, setting the, the standard so high. Uh, and uh, <coughs> William, please, uh, now you give us the dark side of what is really going on, right? Uh, because, of course, Bill was so optimistic, right? Thank you. <laughs> Andrew, I'm not sure I can follow that bill, uh, um, but uh, the two bills are next to one another, and uh, we always share uh, the bill as well as the time allotted, so it's my, it's my turn. It's great to be back. Uh, I was here in the 80s, essentially. Uh, I, um, thank you. I um, remember what happy hours, not only reporting from here and uh, the BBC's offices, but also uh, filling the role which was thrust upon me by my colleagues here of representing the foreign press in Japan. So already uh, my memory of uh, Shintaro Abe is of sitting in his office with a group of uh, other members of this club, bashing the Kisha club system and uh, demanding more uh, openness from there. Uh, since I've been uh, more than 25 years, I guess, uh, outside uh, Japan since then, it has occurred to me that uh, such attitudes of defensiveness and secrecy among uh, the systems of news gathering are pretty common all over the world. Uh, uh, but uh, there is, uh, this is a very peculiar form of, um, should we say, uh, massaging or control of the news flow. And I want today to uh, pick up from Bill's basic point about the open society under threat and suggest that actually uh, it's journalism, if it's going to address these, uh, the issues of the new authoritarianism and the new nationalism, actually has to rethink uh, its task quite uh, profoundly. And I uh, have uh, ventured since the safety of uh, uh, being a full-time employee of the BBC asking all the questions, into new territory, uh, both uh, as a sort of uh, uh, NGO, uh, I because I represent the Association of European Journalists, which is a small, professional, independent, but we've got our foot in the door in quite a number of places, particularly in the Council of Europe, the regional human rights organization in, in Europe. But I'm also a part-time professor of uh, journalism with a speciality on press freedom and journalist safety at the University of Sheffield. I co-founded uh, uh, that center uh, seven or so uh, years ago. And through that, uh, I've discovered that actually uh, not only should journalists engage uh, with the global institutions and national ones and regional ones uh, to defend the journalism and, and put in a framework of protection uh, better, but it is possible to have some results because um, of course, many uh, are involved. I'm not claiming special credit, but it is true that a UK proposal um, back in 2010-11 uh, to the United to UNESCO uh, for a, a, a um, an initiative uh, on press freedom developed into something called the UN Action Plan on the Safety of Journalists and the Issue of Impunity. And I'd just like to say a little bit uh, about uh, the uh, my experience uh, of both the backward trend, the rapid backward trend uh, in every uh, populated continent, um, uh, the Americas, uh, uh, Af Africa, Asia, and indeed Europe and Eurasia, uh, for in terms of paradoxically in the age of the internet, um, the, this increased threat, which I think many Western correspondents or journalists, especially those who stay in their offices, really have very, only the faintest idea of, they learn from their foreign editors that it's now too dangerous to go to many parts of the Middle East, Syria, Iraq, and so on. But actually, when you spend your time with the journalists from uh, Mexico and Pakistan and uh, Azerbaijan and uh, Russia, uh, you discover that this is now the norm. It's the new normal in journalism is to be under, under scrutiny, under, under being watched, and also uh, under attack from you know not where. Uh, so just a few thoughts on that. It does seem to me that, you know, we had a period, the second half of the 20th century, uh, even here in, in the 1980s, working from Japan and heading off to the Philippines for the overthrow of uh, Marcos, uh, heading to South Korea, where they had a, an anti-military, uh, anti-authoritarian uh, revolution of sorts before the, the Seoul Olympics. Before, by the end of the decade, even before the Berlin Wall fell, you had 
uh, amazing movement in the, uh, the Tiananmen uh, uprising, which was uh, at least pro-democracy movement in China, though crushed, and uh, in Burma, uh, a, a, a bloodbath after uh, a rebellion there, which has finally, finally come good. So it's not an even story. But my uh, suggestion to you is that in order to, to grasp the, the new task, it's important to understand what happened around the turn of the, of the millennium. And uh, uh, I'm working with the Council of Europe, with the UN and UNESCO. Uh, I'm mightily impressed by the achievement that we all, uh, as an international community, uh, achieved uh, through the results of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, particularly the International Covenant, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, a binding uh, treaty of international law, which is, of course, not enforceable directly by police or anything, but uh, it set new standards. I heartily recommend you the uh, Human Rights Committee's extraordinary document from 2011. Um, it's got the sexy title of General Comment Number 34, but uh, in the U U terminology, but it is actually an extraordinary um, and uh, intelligent account of the, the way that obligations of states in terms of protecting the zone of freedom of expression, civil society, and particularly uh, media freedom and independence, uh, it has th the standards have been raised. Uh, the European Court in Strasbourg and others have created the most phenomenal uh, uh, body of uh, jurisprudence to protect uh, journalists' sources, uh, to protect journalists from arbitrary uh, arrest and treatment, uh, from unequal battles with powerful people who bring defamation suits and so on. Uh, so uh, Christian Amanpour put it uh, quite eloquently not long ago in a Vanity Fair interview. She said, the biggest change since uh, I went into journalism is whether it's Syria, Libya, Russia, or the Philippines, journalists are being targeted. They're trying to kill the messenger. So we, we all know about Marie, Col uh, uh, Marie Colvin uh, in, in Syria, James Foley and the others uh, killed by uh, ISIS. Uh, and Reporters Without Borders, uh, the latest figures for last year suggest 146 journalists were actually killed. Uh, many of them would have been social media people, bloggers, especially uh, freelancers. And those figures have got dramatically worse uh, in the last uh, five or six uh, years. But more sinister than that is when you consider the kind of uh, reasons why the journalists are being attacked and killed. It's not only in war zones, uh, although it, it, that, that's still a large proportion. It is very much po uh, journalists in all these countries that I mentioned in South America, Africa, uh, across Asia, who report on corruption, crime, major human rights abuses. And the, the great breakthrough to me of the work being done at the UN, this UN Action Plan and so on, is to make the link between the work of journalists asking the questions, holding power to account, and uh, the impact on the whole society. So journalists are among, have been identified as among the most vulnerable uh, representatives of the open society, and also the impact of their killings, whether they're beheaded in Mexico by drug, drug gangs or uh, perhaps by the uh, military intelligence in Pakistan or the Taliban, you don't know, and so on. And, uh, and, and these acts are carried out systematically with complete impunity. The three names that probably stand out of all are uh, Anna Politkovskaya, 2006, uh, Hrant Dink in Turkey uh, the following uh, January, I think, and um, La Santa Wikramatunga in Sri Lanka, who, of course, predicted his own death and said he would point the finger at the, at, at the government for it. And the, 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 the syst consistently systematic thing about these killings uh, is the impunity. And that is another thing that the UN has picked up on. Uh, and there are immense efforts which are too boring to go into, but, uh, for example, in November, uh, U UNESCO is going to have a, a grand gathering, and uh, as it does every two years, there'll be a report from the Director General on uh, the judicial follow-up to killings of journalists in all 60 or 70 countries where journalists have been killed in the last uh, decade. The figures are absolutely appalling. The response rate of states is appalling. Three quarters of, of them have no, make no significant response at all. And the, the rate of, uh, of actual conviction of any 
of the killers. I mean, usually the, the trigger men, not the masterminds, is only around 4% in the, the figures up to, 20, up to 2012. So that is a very dire situation and quite a, a way far, far removed from the tables where we sit. But just a couple of words about the, the, the patterns, the mechanism by which, in my observation, this um, new authoritarianism is imposed. And journalists are very often forced into, in these places, into a choice between being coerced or co-opted. Uh, into being a mouthpiece for one side uh, or, or the other, whether it's ISIS or an authoritarian, or the, the new democratic dictators, as, as, as they, some, some people have called them. I mean, it, just in one paragraph, uh, Russia is the absolute classic in the sense that the 90s were a golden age in a, in a sense. There was a very diverse uh, uh, media after the collapse of the Soviet Union and so on. But when uh, the new regime came in, the, vert the vertical of power of, um, of, of Vladimir uh, Putin, the very first thing he did uh, was to seize control, to, uh, to make offers that they couldn't refuse uh, with threats of uh, removal of all their assets to Berezovsky and Guzinski, the owners of the big uh, media, and then to, to he's since then cemented his control over uh, the state uh, media, particularly uh, uh, television and uh, uh, then the arbitrary use of, uh, of state uh, power uh, laws, which are quite contrary to the European Convention and the international uh, standards on um, uh, protest uh, and uh, the, the use of the administrative ma machines to, uh, for example, to remove Dodge TV, uh, the one successful television uh, opposition uh, channel from uh, any of the airwaves, so they have to work out of somebody's kitchen and do it on the internet. And the troll factories, uh, the tro troll factories uh, uh, to create what Putin himself called uh, a national information space. So this is the new world, and as, as you mentioned, and Andrew too, you know, in Hungary, in Turkey, in, in, in many places all over the world, you actually see this attempt uh, by the authorities, despite the huge diversity of the internet and the millions of voices to steer the thing by a mixture of, of uh, uh, direct ownership, uh, violence or threats of violence, and, uh, and the use of uh, pr uh, press of, of state resources. And in Turkey, I think pr perhaps I'd better skip uh, Turkey. It's just too horrible. It, the, the dissent is uh, uh, immense. I recommend to you perhaps go to uh, the, the uh, website which um, uh, my association, the Association of European Journalists, created with, uh, I think, seven other big organizations, Reporters Without Borders, Committee to Protect Journalists, International Federation of Journalists. Again, this, is, this shows that something actually can be done from a standing point of 10 years ago where it was all impossible for the member states to take an active interest in, uphold, in making other member states uphold their obligations, particularly on freedom of expression. This is now top priority in Europe in the human rights dimension. And it is very horrific to see uh, some elements of the British press and other press bashing uh, the European court in uh, Strasbourg uh, when it is the European court which, I, as I said before, has created these extraordinary protections in, in law which need to be, need to be upheld. But the, so this, this, they call it, it's called the platform on the safety of journalists and we as the NGOs and, and uh, press freedom organizations are able to submit our uh, reports, our alerts, and the, the trick is that these are sent without question immediately to the missions of the governments concerned uh, requesting a, a response. And, and, the, and in their hands is the case law of the European Court of Human Rights and, and the international standards. So at, the, at last, it's an attempt to come back. But as we, as we, thank you. As we do that, as we do that, we, we uh, actually see the situation getting dramatically uh, uh, worse, even in the European area. I'd better stop, uh, Andrew, before you. Uh, I feel, the plug on it. I feel, <laughs> I feel <laughs> terribly embarrassed to have to stop you from exercising your rights of free speech. Uh, but, uh, and, and I completely concur. I think you're quite right that we are the can canary in the coal mine as far as uh, the open society is concerned. Uh, Fernando, please. Uh, <coughs> Do you need... Uh, yeah, after the gloomy picture given us by... William, I shall focus on a marginal aspect of the internet age, the influence of the flow of news on the correspondence uh, work, particularly in area, not 
affected by war or civil war or tension uh, or dramatic uh, and bloody tension. But the, very often people say that with, with such a flow of, of information and very speedy flow, the correspondent had become useless. This is one, day, one of the, uh, the things which goes around, particularly in, in Europe, in daily newspapers. In my view, it's just the opposite. The correspondent is more than ever necessary because he knows the country. He knows the situation. The flow of information is speedy, and we live in an age of consumerism, and consumerism particularly affects the news. And until now, it should be said that the correspondent is often overshadowed by his own editorial staff in the sense that he reports the news, he has to chase the news, and with little time to put them in perspective or to make a, a, a deep analysis. But then the newspaper, the editorial staff, use academic or external contributor to comment and make analysis of what the correspondent has already written and without going into deep analysis because the newspaper policy is that one, to, to use uh, the correspondent for the hard news and the editorial work, the comment, the analysis done by external contributor, by academic why the same correspondent can have the intellectual instrument and direct knowledge of the field which can, which can, have a, a, can result in a quality of writing and thoughts, not less than the external contributor or the academic. This is particularly true for the Anglo, for the English, not English in the sense of nationality, Anglo-American press. Uh, Bill, who has been one of the most successful editors in contemporary journalism, as you all know, as editor-in-chief of The Economist, he has been the, the, the most successful, I would say. He has just said uh, a few words about the work of correspondent, uh, in, in the sense which I mean. Uh, William... Uh, has given the very gloomy picture, not of correspondent, but journalists on the field in dangerous situation. And those dangerous situations have given space to another kind of journalism, the so-called citizen journalism, which in dramatic situation as in Syria, can be the only source of information, although taken with a grain of salt. Because my view is that no, cit as, uh, no citizen journalist can replace a professional journalist uh, who, before relying news, information, analysis, has done his job of verifying the reality, verifying the ground on which the news are based. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um uh, I, I thought, uh, Fernando, that you would give us the definition of the editor, someone who separates the wheat from the chaff and then prints the chaff, yeah. right? Yes. But uh, you have been more, much kinder. Uh, thank you. Uh, Philippe, please tell us about the future of uh, paperless journalism. Uh, well, there is a future, for sure. Uh, as Bill said, it's, it's a great honor and great pleasure to be back. Is it working? Yes. To be back here. I used to sit where you are, trying to ask nasty questions to Japanese officials and politicians. Down in the farm in Portugal, in my archive, I still have the issue of Focus magazine. When I asked that question, uh, the particularly nasty one to Watanabe Michio. Uh, um, now, um, to give you a, an idea of what Mediapart has achieved in eight years, it 
the, the, the site went live officially on March 16, 2008. So eight years yesterday. Uh, as you know, TV series have become very popular the world over, and France is no exception. And in the latest high-budget political thriller called Baron Noir, a sort of French house of cards, uh, Mediapart is playing a very big part because uh, the news leaked by the uh, online journal Take Down uh, the head of the state, the, the French president, and uh, uh, the, the Black Baron, uh, this very powerful regional politician and member of the Na National Assembly, end up in jail. Um, so it give, uh, this site uh, was started from scratch. And you need to remember, by all journalists, um, mostly uh, from Le Monde, but myself from uh, uh, from AFP and, 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 of course, a bunch of young ones, um, when there was widespread scepticism about the fact that a, 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 an online journal uh, by, paid by subscriptor, with, where, where you can only access by subscribing on a monthly basis, could ever uh, succeed, because at that time, Nine years ago, when we started the process, uh, the doxa was that the internet was for free. No one would ever pay a dime, except, of course, for specialized economic news, like for The Economist or The Financial Times. But for general news, certainly not. So let me give you briefly some figures. Uh, we are now close to 120,000 subscri subscribers. The, the sales last year uh, in 2015 were over 10 million euros. Um, the staff went from uh, is 60 people altogether, and there is now um, 39 journalists on a full-time basis with a permanent contract, plus a number of, of freelance, not only in France, but all over the world. Uh, the, the operating profit last year was 1.8 million, which gives you an idea of the operating margin. I mean, by the French media standard or by the European media standard, it's over 10%. It's very, very, very high. And, um, and the net income was over 7,000 uh, euros. We have about 3 million uh, unique viewers on average per month, and uh, six million monthly vi visits on average. And the site has been profitable since 2011. Now, you have to put those figures in, in perspective. Nothing to compare with the circulation of Japanese newspaper. But remember that the two largest newspapers in France, Le Monde and Le Figaro, have a circulation of 300,000 copies officially probably less if you discount some of the copies that are giving away. And, uh, so this, is, as, this has been a resounding success. Now, what is the, 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 the nuclear reactor of Mediapart has been investigation. Uh, the idea was that we should be able to spend money on a long time in, and costly investigation. Two cases got uh, a great audience, I don't know about Japan, but certainly we heard in China, for instance. One is the famous Betancourt case. That was the case of the heiress of the L'Oreal Empire, and Mediapart made public that she was being surrounded by a bunch of crooks, including uh, some very high profile politicians, one went on to become the president of the Republic, Nicolas Sarkozy, taking, avant taking advantage of our old age and weaknesses to basically uh, rid her of her money. Uh, that, that case had a massive repercussion and, and uh, was really the launch pad for the success of Mediapart. The other case is had less uh, uh, repercussion outside France, but it had some in Europe. It was the budget minister of the socialist government in charge of fi fighting tax evasion. 
that had a hidden account in Switzerland. Um, uh, it's an interesting case. If there is question, I may come back to it, because for three months, after we break that news until the minister admitted it and, and uh, uh, um, um, resigned, uh, we were completely isolated, even from our fellow journalists. And that was probably the toughest time we went through because um, we had absolutely, except for a few uh, uh, medias, absolutely no support among our fellow journalists. Uh, and that was a pretty uh, sad episode. Now, um, but media, the, the creation of Mediapart had an impact on the French media in a sense that investigation became fashionable again. And a newspaper like Le Monde created a, a, a unit dedicated to investigate that sort of, of uh, uh, dirty businesses. Um, now, of course, um, as I said, the, the, the economic model has been working um, to the point that almost every media in the world has, trying, has been trying to take refuge behind a paywall, uh, the one that used to say that uh, people would not pay for, for news are now restricting access to their news and you have to become a subscriber. F and that has become the general trend uh, for general news media and that's when we started really, as I said before, was not at all the case. Uh, but of course, we are uh, still uh, young relatively fragile business, and we are now facing something I would like to be able to come back uh, in, uh, in the discussion, um, um, a, di a direct attack by the, from the French government on a, on a VAT issue. Uh, very briefly, one particular, one way the government wanted to protect the old media was to allow them to benefit from a very low VAT rate, 2.5%. While the online, uh, what we call pure player like us, had to pay the regular tax rate that is now 20%, was 19.6 at the time. It's a fight we have been fighting for ever since the beginning. And last year, we have been fined more than 4 million euros for not applying that cons uh, completely unjust uh, tax rate. Of course, we are going to fight that up to the European Court of Justice. We are confident that we are, willing, we are going to win. But in, in the meantime, we had to pay. We had already to pay 2.5 million, and, and we are the rest is delayed until the various re recourse are, are, are going through. But it gives you an idea. Uh, yeah. And the, the perspective I wanted to make, and I think we should go back to this, this is very peculiar to France. This is a country where there is no rule of law for the state. The state has its own rule. And in that particular case, the fiscal administration continued to apply the VAT rate of 20% for five years after the parliament changed the law and said that all media should be treated equal, equally whether you are print or whether you are online. So we still have a lot of uh, work cut out for us to redress that situation. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Philippe. That was uh, very interesting. Uh, so, uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to open the floor for questions. Uh, normally, we would take the questions only from the working press, but since we have a diverse uh, group here and since uh, many people may wish to ask questions, I will give preference to the working press, but if anybody else wishes to ask a question, that's fine. As long as you identify yourself, tell us who you are and, if, and who you work for. I, um, Yes, and there is someone who is actually very much a working press person, uh, Anthony Rowley. Thank you. Okay, good. Uh, 
um, Anthony, oh. sorry, Anthony Rowley, uh, Singapore Business Times, and formerly um, Far Eastern Economic Review. Um, before I um, ask my question, I'd just like to add to what the moderator said in his introductions and say we also have in the audience today on my right, Carol van Wolferen, a very celebrated journalist and author of The Enigma of Japanese Power and many other books. Um, having said that, um, for seven or eight years, I was the chief judge of something called the Dajer, which is the Developing Asia Journalism Awards, which was run by the Asian Development Bank Institute. And it was a remarkable experience because we um, encouraged journalists from all over the developing world of Asia to write essays on corruption, on poverty, and other topics, um, environmental degradation, and so on. Some of the stuff was extremely moving, and the journalists who contributed to this often did so at considerable risk. But giving them awards, and they were quite generous awards given by the uh, ADB, um, recognize their efforts at least. Um, you know, in, in America we have Pulitzer Prizes and things like that, but a lot of these journalists in, in developing countries <laughs> put their lives at risk and receive very little, if any, publicity at all. And I wonder whether there is any similar scheme in Europe or in the States. I'm not aware of it. If not, I would like to suggest that maybe some of you gentlemen in your daily um, contacts with journalists might put forward the suggestion. Thank you, Anthony. I think that was uh, that will require a response from William, right? Uh, yes, simply. Uh, uh, I mean, for example, on April the 13th, Index on Censorship, which is actually part of the group that I'm working with and the Council of Europe work, uh, has its awards ceremony. It's a very big event. They, they have uh, at least 10 different categories, and they, they get people from uh, you know, from remote uh, uh, India, from uh, from, from uh, and journalists who, who've been jailed, and also uh, Ahmed Sikh, uh, who was uh, uh, jailed for many years in in Turkey uh, until some reforms came in, uh, and he was released uh, some time ago. Uh, is also being hosted in 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 London at a similar uh, event. Uh, I mean, there is the European Parliament has the Sakharov Prize, which is uh, the UNESCO has this very big World Press Freedom Day uh, prize, um, which uh, includes, it, it's named after a Colombian journalist who was killed um, uh, many years ago, uh, but it is, the cent and actually it's worth mentioning that the that UNESCO's World Press Freedom Day uh, is not a Western invention. Uh, there, there's a bit of a habit among, uh, should we say, uh, um, conventional or, or government side journalists around the world uh, to uh, treat uh, these issues as uh, uh, as an impugning their own national uh, national pride, uh, but that that World Press Freedom Day was um, a proposal by African journalists after the end of apartheid, saying never again, and uh, it is a very prestigious uh, award. And around it, there's a major international conference every year around May the 3rd. This year it's in Helsinki, as a matter of fact, and a lot flows from that. Um, and I think the fact that the UN, uh, in its new Sustainable Development Goals, has named uh, access to information, to, to impartial information, as well as uh, universal access to justice as one of its, its major goals, is, is also going to uh, pr produce funds that kind of thing, but actually, you know, the, 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 the Europe is absolutely crammed full. Uh, every foundation has got uh, a, a awards of that kind. It's very busy, and more and more, the, it seems to me the content of news is always, there's always space for how the news has arrived at. What are the source of the news? What, what, is, what is the filtering process? Who's, who's in charge? Who's trying to uh, manipulate whether it's you know Hungary is a famous one, uh, Turkey is is, is, is is like that as well. But public service broadcasting in in um, in Poland, in Romania, uh, everywhere you look, uh, governments, the, 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 those the ruling parties are trying to control. So uh, the, these these uh, the highlighting of the um, of of the work uh, valuable work that you you, you mentioned of uh, encouraging journalists. Uh, to, to write in challenging ways is uh, uh, is vital, and the European Union too too is has got major programs uh, along those lines, and including a, a number of awards. Thank you, William. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, uh, Joel. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, 
prior to the introduction of the uh, speakers, um, the moderator has expressed a uh, name of John Harris. Is this the John Harris from the Nomon no Shimbun? No. Okay, good, because I was going to say something about impunity. Um, there is in, uh, in, the, in Japan today a big fear of um, the power, um, the media being quite targeted, the Japanese media are being targeted. We've seen recently that there were some commentators who were fired, basically. Um, we saw it at NHK, TV Asahi, uh, TBS, Ishisan, and, uh, and others, Kuniya-san, and some uh, anchor are going to leave. So this is a tr the trend we have right now. Have, have you felt it since you are watching Japan a lot? And let me just read you um, an article title I have right in front of me here. Um, a Hime students required to report their political activity. You know that in Japan, the uh, people are going to vote at 18 years old now, and there is some kind of trend from the authorities to push kids not to reveal too much of their political activities. So those two examples, the media thing, plus this kind of wind of censorship on Japan is something that bothers us a lot. And I'm sure that you, with all your experience, have the same impression. Could I hear each of you on this, please, if you can. Thank you. OK. Uh, Philippe has said he'd like to say something about it. Is anyone? Bill, you would like to say something? OK. Um, after. Uh, as you all remember, a friend was struck in uh, last November 13 by a terrorist attack in Paris that uh, caused uh, over 100 casualties. And the uh, government um, thought, I will not say took opportunity, but thought that uh, they needed to pass new legislation to combat terrorism. In the, uh, and there have been a state of emergency that has been renewed uh, and might become, if we listen to the current prime minister, might become permanent because it said it's going to last until we get rid of Daesh. So it might last 20 years. Um, and in the original legislation, there was a part uh, dedicated to the restriction of the freedom of the press. Uh, the protest has been so huge and unanimous, then the government backed down. But I'm sure it's going to come back. So um, I'm not saying that uh, we are under constant pressure. Uh, what I can say that the reason why I went from AFP to Mediapart is that it would guarantee the same independence I, I enjoyed working for AFP for 26 years. Um, where there is not political, there is, there could be political pressure, but you can resist it. There is no pressure from the state of the government because we don't take any subsidies. And there is, of course, no pressure from the business interest because we don't take any advertisement. Pressure are coming from all directions. What is key is the, the ability to resist. Uh, I will just add, I, I absolutely agree with that. I will just add a couple of points. One is uh, an observation. I mean, I think one of the key we, uh, problems is uh, self-censorship mixed with complacency. Sometimes it's overt conformism and self-censorship, which happens uh, certainly, of course, in, in this country, but it does happen in other countries as well. But second, a, set, a sense of complacency in our information age. I think I, Anthony, I'm sure, would agree from your background. I'm shocked by how little fuss there has been in the British media about the kidnapping of the booksellers in Hong Kong uh, and, the, uh, and uh, what, what's been done with them by the Chinese authorities, uh, almost as if Hong Kong had never been a British uh, colony, as if we hadn't signed a treaty with, with them. Just, oh, well, we just make a small official protest and nothing else. But also in the media, it's been very played down, I'd say, or at least almost completely overlooked by large parts of the British media. And I think that um, that is perhaps the parochialism I was talking about, but it is also about uh, self-censorship, the most fearsome consequence of that kind of thing that Joel uh, is talking about is the consequences on others that makes them self-censor. Uh, and I think it's important that other media who have, as, as Philippe says, have the uh, 
resilience and capability of speaking out must speak out, uh, I think, in, in trying to uh, encourage this. It happens in every country. I spent a little bit of my time, um, as Fernando knows, fighting libel suits and intimidation from Silvio Berlusconi in Italy. Uh, and the key thing about that was not that that about fighting libel suits, it was the problem was that a lot of the it Italian media were simply self-censoring uh, around the story. The privilege of the international media, of an international publication like The Economist, was the ability to resist uh, and not to be part of that self-censorship. And that's what we have to fight. Uh, I've been most remiss. I, I did not recognize Ambassador Numata among us, among our distinguished guests. And, uh, I, and uh, it just shows that actually uh, uh, journalists and their sources can have uh, healthy and warm relationships. I just want to, I think the... the, the I was thinking I would, uh, I would be carefully desisting uh, my temptation to speak, but... Um, I've listened with great interest. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Sadaki Namata. I was the foreign ministry spokesman from 1998 to 2000. I knew Bill very well in London. I've been fascinated by, uh, by what I've been hearing. Um, and um, what's the best way to put it? <laughs> the point about self-censorship is something that we should all be thinking about. By when I say we, um, including the members of the Japanese media, perhaps there is some tendency. I can say this because I've been retired for eight years now. <laughs> and my last post was Canada, where there is relative uh, press freedom. I was also ambassador to Pakistan. And William referred to Pakistan. Um, do they have any freedom? I, I doubt it. But uh, uh, my <clears throat> interest was aroused by the fact that uh, Bill Emmett referred to self-censorship because there, are, there may be some movements within our society which tempt even the media uh, in that direction, in which case we should be uh, cognizant of that, and when I, when I say we in this context, I mean my former colleagues in the government as well. Thank you. Uh, I see a hand. Is that Drini? Drini, please. Okay. Uh, this is Drini Kakchi, our president, yes. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you for coming today. Um, I'm just uh, interested about the comments f about press freedom, and since I'm from J Sri Lanka, and I did do a stint um, during the time that La Santa was killed, by the way. And I think in my way of looking at it, while I do agree uh, with Philip that the key is to resist, I think a lot of journalists left in uh, countries like Sri Lanka or, Pakistan or Africa, for example, uh, you know, people who are left behind, who don't go to the West as um, asylum seekers, their mission is to innovate and to be able to um, respect the freedom of uh, journalism by being able to face the restrictions by, be, by being innovative. And I thought maybe you could share today some ways that newspapers can survive and what do readers really want to read? Because my little experience in Sri Lanka, when we had all this uh, censorship uh, during the war, was to, for example, write about uh, corruption, but in a different way. Um, write about it, say, in, in a way that looks at economic development instead of using the word corruption and try to get the message across. So I'm just interested in how we can survive newspapers in this age of consumerism. Thank you. Anyone inspired to talk about that? Okay, sure, go ahead. Uh, well, one, one uh, hopeful sign in Pakistan, I'm sure you're aware of this, is very recently the divided press, which in the past would turn on their rivals. If one of them was attacked, uh, they wouldn't mention it, they would give them no support. 
In the last couple of months, the so-called Pakistan Coalition on Media Safety, PCOMS, which is supported by the Open Society, supported by the UN in Pakistan, has, has they, the editors have come together and they've agreed that they will all report on the, the attacks, every attack, the serious attack, and they will also chase up uh, the investigation side of it uh, against impunity. So that's a collective action uh, by uh, the, the press. Uh, I, I mean, the, the white van man syndrome in Sri Lanka was famous. A lot of people were, were disappeared. And the figures that I mentioned from UNESCO, there's a huge blip around the time towards the end of the Civil War with, uh, I think, 30 or so journalists are recorded as having been killed and, and, again, complete impunity. But at least the good news is that there is a new regime uh, in power which is making some uh, uh, promises. May I just, Andrew, touch on uh, in response to... Uh, the, the question and, and points about uh, Japan, because uh, uh, following these things uh, at the international level and seeing the work of particularly the special rapporteur on freedom of expression, David Kay, and uh, the Human Rights Council, which contrary to some reports, has done fantastic work with support from uh, some NGOs, has uh, the UN bodies have passed, I think, five resolutions on safety of journalists, uh, uh, you know, pressing states to live up to their uh, standards on legislature, law enforcement, justice, and so on, with oversight mechanisms. Ban Ki-moon does regular reports on a General Assembly resolution of 2013. This is, again, goes against the grain for a lot of journalists to, to be engaged in these things, but the, 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 it is really a war out there uh, to, 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 to protect. So in Japan, it is very um, distressing to see that uh, there was some confusion, uh, some um, uh, obstacle that prevented David Kay's visit in uh, December. He's concerned about the secrets law, uh, as so many uh, laws on terrorism and secrets, uh, vaguely uh, worded, ill-defined, uh, far too broad uh, for, from the point of view of, uh, of international standards, and also uh, the indirect pressure on journalists, which very much mirrors what's happened in Turkey, where literally thousands of journalists have been uh, excluded from, the, from their work, either by the threat of uh, prosecution uh, or by uh, telephone calls from Erdogan's uh, office on, uh, to the uh, editors. Um, and uh, so uh, I think it's very inappropriate for a prime minister like Abe uh, to send a letter before the election uh, telling journalists that they have to be uh, fair uh, and uh, accurate. Obviously, that is a form of indirect uh, pressure to be favorable to, to those in power. And similarly, uh, the appointment of a chair of NHK who met the disgraceful remark that if the prime minister... Uh, says uh, uh, right, uh, it, we cannot go uh, left. I think in my country th that person would have been immediately dismissed through public pressure. So public pressure is also vital. Thank you. Uh, Philippe, do you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, um, obviously in, in democratically advanced uh, countries or societies, um, we do not face uh, physical threat or direct censorship. So the issue of self-censorship is, is, is a major one. And it's really linked to uh, the business model of the newspapers, when, where the resources are scarce, when the, uh, there is less and less people in the newsrooms, when you cannot uh, investigate properly. Um, that's where the freedom of the press is, is under threat. In a country like France, or, without exception, so-called national newspaper, that is Paris-based newspaper, are, are now armed in the hands of tycoons. Uh, people with no history, no interest in the media business, but that went into the media for several reasons. And, um, and there is no exception. That's why we uh, launched Mediapart. And the idea at the end, I cannot go into details, is that uh, the current founders and the uh, outside investor that made that uh, venture possible will, um, uh, will uh, retreat and the, 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 the ownership of the media part will be handed to its staff. 
Uh, it's going to be a rather long process. It has been made much more complicated by this tax issue with the French government, but uh, that's, that's going to be solved over time. And uh, the idea that the owner of the newspaper should be the staff, um, I think is, is very, very sound. Of course, you can uh, always hope that uh, somebody like Jeff Bezos or others will come with a very big, uh, uh, big money and support your independence, but it's going to be challenged. So, um, and that's what uh, online technology is making possible because the entry cost is very low and you can build up gradually your workforce, uh, your resources, starting from a relatively low point because the entry cost is much lower than in print or TV. And by the way, we have been diversif diversifying in, in videos and, and uh, all sorts of, of related activities. Uh, that's, that's one possible answer. Siegfried Nittel writing for the Austrian newspaper, The Standard. Uh, Mr. Horsey, you talked about the physical threat to journalists. I think about a different threat for journalists. Mr. Rees, you, you said uh, a newspaper perhaps will survive in the, in the paywall. But I think the other way to survive for the newspaper is to, to employ less regular journalists. They work with freelancer, or they have, uh, I think in, in, in my country, Germany, the major newspaper before had uh, uh, every time two journalists, one for economy and one for policy. Now it's only one. They, they have only one. So what, what does this mean for the future of journalism? <coughs> So do you advocate the disappearance of journalists? <laughs> Physical disappearance. <laughs> it is true that uh, in recent years, before the, the economic crisis, uh, there was an inflation of journalism and newspapers uh, enlisted more and more staff, and now they have to, to face the downsizing. But uh, I... I, I disagree with your view that uh, that journalism is doomed to disappear. Technically, I mean, it's, it's happening. Not that it's happening. Yeah, happen. it's happening. But somebody has physically to do the editorial job, and who can do that if not jo good journalists? Not possibly good journalists. Possibly good. This is, but I would say that uh, a few words, I would like to add a few words um, on an aspect which, on which uh, Philippe Rias has touched upon. The fact that, uh, at least in, in Italy, for a long time, we did not have uh, a, pub, a real, pure publisher. Newspapers are owned by people who show them as a medal. As a, as a, a bouquet of flowers, it is a, dec a social decoration and an instrument of pressure. Recently, has been in Italy took place uh, one, one of the largest merger oper or acquisition operation in in Europe. Uh, the newspaper for which I was corresponding here, La Stampa. Uh, merged with Repubblica, which is the major Italian newspaper as a circulation. So they will make a conglomerate, uh, which will lead to reducing of staff, to downsizing of the, of the staff of the two newspapers, plus 16 regional newspapers. It means that a publisher will control at least 60% of the printed press in Italy. Mm. Uh, this is a really an impressive acquisition. 
uh, not a merger but acquisition, uh, which gives uh, uh, food for bad thoughts. But this is the situation, and we do not have a media part, as in France they had the courage to launch it. In, in Italy, uh, the newspaper for which I worked for many years was owned by Fiat, which is not a pure publisher. <laughs> they do something else, their job is to do something else, but historically, has always been, on, has always been Fiat ownership. And I should say that uh, with um, rather good elegance, the interference by the property were, were not censored by the, by the editorial staff. Certainly, you could not criticize Fiat cars on that newspaper. <laughs> 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 and now, uh, with this merger and acquisition, one only publisher will, will have such an influence on the entire uh, media world, and he too has a lot of interest, uh, particularly in electricity network distribution, which has not much to do with newspapers, but that's the situation. Okay, uh, we have a situation here. We have lots of people wanting to ask questions and lots of people wanting to answer them. No, so, question, so, so Bill, one, you have something you want to say? I, I only wanted, to, I think mainly people should answer, ask her questions, but uh, I only want to support Philippe and to say it's absolutely clear we must understand that the future of journalism is subscription model uh, and that this is a very good news for journalists because the only thing that will persuade anyone to subscribe to something is the journalism. Uh, and so this should be the future for journalists, but of course it's a hard transition. Uh, old journalism was uh, advertising plus circulation or subscription as cream on the cake. Now it's the other way around. Uh, and uh, we have to persuade readers why they should subscribe. And that's what Media Power has succeeded in doing. Thank you very much. We have, uh, let me give you the order. Carol, then you and then the gentleman uh, over there, and then the student. And that's going to be the questions. Thank you. Yeah. Carol von Wolfen, former correspondent for the Dutch daily MSA Handelsblad. Before the subject popped up, the subject of self-censorship, it occurred to me I should ask Bill Horsley. Perhaps it's a good idea to start a brother organization index on self-censorship. But that would mean, <laughs> that would mean uh, devising, designing ways to detect and to measure it, which of course is very difficult compared to normal censorship. The point I would like to make about self-censorship is the sources of it are generally considered authorities, and you don't want to run afoul of authorities, you want to go to jail and all that, that's why we exercise self-censorship. I believe, after recent experiences, that a much more powerful source are your brethren. Yeah. They're official stories, and I'm looking at the Dutch national newspapers and broadcasting. I can see self-censorship in a way I have never, ever experienced before. On Greece, on anything having to do with neoliberal controversial subjects, banks, bailouts and whatever. On Russia, on Putin, the demonization of Putin is horrendous, I'm beyond belief. On the Ukraine, and on uh, Syria, there was a news blackout in the early stages when Russia went into Syria in order to make sure that the Assad government would not fall. A news blackout. Not an opinion blackout, a news blackout. Okay, this kind of self-censorship is incredible. I never believed I should see the day. I can tell you that I could today not write for the newspaper I used to write for. No way. Not possible because of this. So I think before we start looking at all manner of governments, you know, endangering journalists, etc., put hands in our own bosom, and maybe it's a way, Bill Horsley, to start thinking and devising about a way to detect it, 
because I think much of it goes undetected. When there are official stories on something, it is extraordinarily different, difficult for a journalist who also has to worry about ha holding on to his job, as we know this has become more and more difficult, to go against the grain. Thank you. Uh, that's a question, right? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thanks for an easy, easy one, uh, Carol. No, I, I mean, actually, I've been dealing a lot with uh, Bulgaria, Romania, the, the, the Balkan area, uh, Serbia, and there, uh, journalists feel, I mean, the, the whole climate is, is, is hostile to, in, in, to independent investigation. And when journalists uh, get charged, get, get, uh, get uh, a lawsuit against them, or they're attacked in a back street, uh, they don't get support from their colleagues, particularly in a place like uh, Bulgaria, and it's sinking fast. Um, uh, actually, there is a major study going on now in Europe under the Council of Europe. It's a major survey of uh, hopefully a thousand or more journalists from all over on um, the scale and methods of self-censorship and in intimidation. So they're trying to get a handle on it, but uh, uh, the, I mentioned with the Pakistan case, the, the solidarity is extremely extremely rare, um, and, and uh, on your other point about uh, the control on uh, journalists from the head office and so on, I mean, for example, the BBC, I think it's well known that journalists are chafing because very often a, a foreign correspondent or any correspondent is basically told what the story is, and he's got to go out and uh, he's got to book uh, the, it's his budget from different programs, all of which expect a certain angle which he's got to sell in advance, so there is very little freedom of, uh, of, of maneuver. And if the story is different from what the editor who commissioned it wanted, then, then you'll be unpopular or they, they may not run it. This is a, a completely right. So you, that independence of, of mind is, uh, is, is very hard to uh, come by. And uh, we've seen in, in these places, Turkey, uh, all these, in Bulgaria, all these places where a few oligarchs, as indeed in France, Run, run the show, they, they set the tone, and everybody knows what the score is. Greece is the worst of all, completely corrupt, with a, a, a small number of owners uh, basically <coughs> using the media as their mouthpieces. Of course, it's impossible. I mean, self-censorship goes without, without uh, question uh, there. Very, very uh, uh, sa sad uh, situation, and, and uh, the, black, I mean, the blackouts. I mean, I, I, uh, Ukraine, uh, I mean, my own take on, on Ukraine is I think the journalists there have shown the most extraordinary courage, as has civil society as a whole. I think the, the Ukraine story is basically solidarity in Poland uh, 25 years uh, later. Th this, this society has got the most developed sense of the need for, uh, um, it, for creating the institutions of an open society. They're up against the old uh, Soviet a block mentality of the owners of the mainstream media. They've moved rapidly to online and elsewhere. They have very, absolutely thriving journalism, journalism schools, uh, and uh, it, uh, even in, at the time, at time of war. So I think there are bright spots in the, in the darkness. Th thank you. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Nana. Huh? Nana Koslan, thank you. Hi, my name is Nana Koyamamori. I, um, I write for L'Espresso, Italian weekly magazine. So, uh, and uh, I, uh, when I was living in Tokyo, I was a correspondent for Bloomberg Television. Um, I feel as a correspondent, I think my, our role is changing with this digital era. Um, ten years ago, we don't have to edit a video, we don't have to take photographies. We just have to come to the uh, press conference and write and send a story. So uh, we are more multi-skilled in this digital era, and I, definitely the technology is helping. Um, the quality of iPhone photos are better um, with uh, all the video gadgets. Um, everybody can take really good quality photos. But on the other hand, I think the quality of writing, quality of images are much, much worse. And there is a kind of polarization of uh, um, good papers with good photos and there are less and less people reading. So I would like to know how um, this um, flow of online journalism is affecting, how it's going to affect our future. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very, very uh, uh, 
pre prescient question, very significant. Uh, I happen to subscribe to a magazine called Foreign Policy, which, is, uh, which has verbal diarrhea. I mean, they have no discipline whatsoever. It just keeps on and on and on and on. And the good thing about the old journalism is that you had 450 words, and you had to say it in those 450 words. And you had to respect the time and intelligence of your reader. Uh, any comments on that? In, of course, I'm completely... Thank you. Well, I shall comment uh, with an example uh, at the introduction of Van Wolferen. You spoke of a dehumanization of Putin. Well, during the Cold War, uh, there was an, a kind of militancy in the Western press also, in favor or opposing the Soviet Union. But there was no dehumanization of Brezhnev for other people. Now everything is focused personally on Putin, and I read a report on Reuters, which quoted an American official, of a, a high official of the Treasury, mentioned, saying that Putin is corrupt and blah, 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 which can be true. Should, but I should remind you that when Mussolini was killed, when Hitler was uh, killing himself, when Stalin died, they didn't find a coin in their, in their pockets. Those people do not love money, those people love Power. <laughs> money is nothing. They own the country. What should they do with, with, with money? Yeah. With money. <laughs> so this is my personal view. But the thing which, which makes me be even excited, uh, the, Amer the, the American official and Reuters reporting without keeping distance, saying that Putin has spent billions for his villas for his personal residence. And now it is true that Putin, not Putin, the president of Russia has 12 official residence. But it is the president of Russia, it's not Putin personally. As in Ukraine, when uh, Yanukovych was ousted, all the media showed his villa, which was perhaps certainly a useless investment. But it was not his personal villa, it was the villa built for the president of Ukraine. So those are, are not subtle distinctions, these are fundamental distinctions. You can say whatever you want of Yanukovych, you can say whatever you want on Putin, but you cannot say that he has spent billions for his personal residence. The, he has spent billions for the residence of the president of the Russian Federation. That's it. In my, in my view, a good journalist should make those differences. Thank you. Uh, okay, go ahead. Um, my, my biggest concern regarding the future of journalism is whether young journalists will get the chance to get the experience, because nothing much the experience. Um, and for that, you have to be given the opportunity to travel, to live in foreign countries. And is this, as you know, uh, very expensive? It can be done uh, more cheaply than it used to be, and I think that's the case here in Tokyo, for instance. But if we, um, you know, one negative point in the Mediapart experience, and it's not, we are not the only ones to have, uh, take, to have been, uh, to have this, that conclusion, is the dialogue with the readers. You know, the internet was supposed to establish a new type of dialogue. The journalists would not, uh, deliver anymore from the moral high ground of, of, from India, and and the, they will be a sort the readers and the journalists will be on a sort of equal basis because uh, if you write a mistake, any reader can immediately correct you. Um, the the fact is um, the balance of it has been 99 percent of the commentaries are useless. Uh, very few are are what we call contribution, that is adding value to your article. And, uh, and that is something that, so we are, but on the other hand, we are in a transition. Uh, at Mediapart, we have been saved the, the most hideous, like anti-Semitic commentaries because the subscription is creating a barrier. Uh, when there is absolutely no filter uh, and we have no monitoring, 
it's a lot of paper of, of monitoring, uh, advanced monitoring, uh, pre-monitoring before the comments are being published. We have been taking that chance. And it's working in a sense that the commentaries are w staying within proper limits most of the time, but they are just not interesting. They are not contributing, they are not enriching the content. Uh, well, I, well, I'm, let's say 90%, not 99. Uh, and, <laughs> so, but it's very much a transition. I mean, the, you know, the, the readership has to be, well, educated is not the proper word, but has to uh, get experience as well. And, uh, and again, our model by subscription is probably the best answers because they, they it seems to have a sort of ownership of our work. And this is, the basis is sound. Now they have to become more sophisticated and, and also they have to have a sort of self-monitoring that is reader monitoring other readers. It's a collective exercise. Right. We're, we're pressed for time. Go ahead, just 30 seconds. Okay, I'll only say I, I, I think that uh, the quality versus quantity problem is clear. But it was always there in, the, in print media as well. Uh, and I think uh, the publication that Tamsin represents here in Tokyo, The Economist, and that I had the honor of working for, one of its merits was how little it gave you. <laughs> um, and I think that actually what we have to reintroduce in online, in the online flow, is that the same discipline, the same offering to a subscriber. We will not give you too much, but we will give you the best. Uh, thank you, uh, um, Bill. I think that's exactly what I wanted to say. Um, uh, David, I'd like to give uh, the student a uh, priority. Uh, um, Sor Sarai, is that your name? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sarai Flores, and I'm a journalism student at Temple University. And I'm also an aspiring journalist. Um, so it's really awesome to see you guys here today speaking about journalism. Um, my question mainly is for uh, university students who are majoring in journalism. You guys spoke a lot about how the traditional model of journalism is changing quickly with the rise of uh, digital content and citizen journalists and paywalls. So I was wondering what advice you could impart for aspiring journalists like myself. Like how do we uh, break into the journalism industry and then how do we keep our jobs? Like, I, it's a tough question, but really, like, yeah. Uh, well, uh, uh, there's the financial sector, there is, uh, uh, there's uh, a government careers. Uh, journalism, did you say? Yes. Uh, uh, any, any advice, Bill? Uh, well, I, I, pers I, I worked for a very big media organization. BBC accounts for about half the journalists in Fleet Street, apparently. To my mind, what the BBC represents, The Guardian, which is under critical threat from uh, the economic uh, uh, seeping away of, of its model, and also from pressures from the government, which, don't forget, did threaten, we'll close you guys down over WikiLeaks uh, and then Snowden. And to my, to my mind, without those big beasts, uh, the landscape is going to be not just impoverished, but unrecognizable. I mean, it, it may well happen in 50 years, uh, but, but the brands, I think the, the brands will survive, like The Economist has, has thrived. Hopefully the Financial Times and other ones will, will thrive. Uh, it, you just need, you, you know this better than we do, uh, you need the agility, the, 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 the skill set in a, in, in, a, in a way that is, that is alien uh, to people. We went through several technical revolutions, but, but now you've got to do absolutely everything uh, yourself, all the, all the editing and, and so on. But there are now a whole uh, uh, cradle of new organizations, BuzzFeed, Vice News, and so on, which are actually going out and making the news inexpensively, uh, uh, ambitious young people going to southeastern Turkey. Uh, actually, they, one, they got arrested briefly. That was uh, it, it covering what the Turkish uh, authorities are doing uh, there and, and the PKK. It, it is, and they, they've got quite a big staff, and they have made it, uh, they've made it uh, sustain, sustainable. They are making it, and they are turning into variants of what we used, used to see. Again, that's a threat to the BBC and so on. If public sector broadcasting, which is still big in much of Europe and, and, and indeed Japan, if, if that were to go, that would be an immense, uh, immense <coughs> removal of, of jobs, but it, it's still there. 
but there are that whole palette, and not just the commentary, things like Huffington Post and so on, which obviously they don't pay, that's an extremely simple uh, model, uh, but, and it does, I suppose it adds to the variety of commentary. There's another one in Britain called The Conversation, uh, which, which academics can contribute to because it's, it's, they, they want to get their name out there, but it's not a sustainable job. So you have to be immensely agile, capable, and ambitious, and, and go out and create your own uh, specialty. And the other thing that journalists need to do is now verification. Verification of all the stuff in the ocean out there on the internet. It's the new, it's the new um, uh, uh, task of journalism is, is to do the verification, uh, the multiplication, the, the, the ascertain, ascertaining uh, for the public and gain respect for it. Um, I have some practical advice for you. The, this club is going to start a series on how to make money on the internet for journalists. Please attend it and you will have the answers. Uh, watch this space. How much does the course cost? Uh, uh, everyone is welcome. Uh, uh, there's a gold mine out there, I'm sure. Uh, anyway, uh, yes, uh, there's, uh, there's two questions, but uh, David, you've been asking. Uh, can you do it for very, very quickly? David Satterwhite, an associate member of the past 17 years um, and former managing director of the Economist Group, and it's great to see uh, Bill back. Um, there was mention of the booksellers out of Hong Kong and uh, no mention of the 46, I believe, uh, journalists currently um, um, detained by the authorities in China uh, under horrific circumstances. So I just wanted to mention that. But um, on a positive note, uh, having worked very closely with the democratization movement in South Korea for 10 years during the military years and actual agents in the editorial room blacking out pages or uh, preventing that day's newspaper to go to press. I was pleased to see the courts overturn the uh, libel case against Mr. Kato of the Sanke Shimbun recently, um, brought by uh, forces on behalf of the current president. Um, and so. I'm wondering if there are other positive developments that we can also hear about in which there's sort of a fighting back. Um, um, and as an associate member, I'll add, we're very concerned. And I think the journalist um, colleagues here are very concerned about the current Japanese government's attitude towards this club. Um, there may be security issues of not having the prime minister over here, but for political reasons, they're very, very hesitant to come over and, and engage in open dialogue. I'm wondering how we might um, move forward to engage the Japanese government in being less, uh, the current administration, I'll say, in, in, um, in its ways of clamping down on press freedoms. Thank you. David, one second. Uh, is that... Is that related in some way? Could you want to? Why don't you ask your question also, and then we can answer two together? Can you go ahead? That will be the last question. That's fine. Go ahead. Hey, my name is Stefano Carre for the Italian Economic Daily newspaper. Uh, waiting for the future of journalism, the journalism uh, by subscription. In this phase of transition, I found myself in a paradoxical situation in some way. So I am uh, basically the last permanent uh, Italian correspondent in Japan. My company pays me. My company pays me to stay here, okay? And uh, half or more than half of my job is to provide for free to everybody in the world on the internet for free uh, content and uh, including original content like, I mean, I make video also and edit by myself and so on. So maybe it's also my fault because, uh, you know, I fed up of fighting for uh, getting space on the written edition of the paper, you know, because it's, uh, also the, 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 the number of pages are shrinking. So, I mean, so I, I tend to, um, to write and uh, provide content on the internet for free. So I wonder if uh, there, uh, there is an equilibrium, point of equilibrium between uh, paper edition, uh, internet for free, internet by subscription in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this phase of transition. Thanks. Okay, we can answer both David's question and Stefan's question in whatever order you want, whoever wants to answer. And that's the, we're running past deadline, so go ahead. Any comments? 
I, I would hesitate to make any advice about how to deal with the Japanese government uh, as, a, um, as a parachuting in uh, visitor. Um, so I wouldn't want to uh, say anything about that. But uh, I think um, on the, uh, and uh, maybe William, as a former representative in dealing with these matters, might have some <laughs> thoughts. Um, but uh, on um, the interplay between, uh, between, the dif between free and, uh, and subscription, I don't think that this will go away. You have the, f have the fortune of working for a publication owned by Confindustria, yes, by, by the, uh, the Cadan Ren of, uh, of Italy and this will, this will continue. The Guardian um, thought that it could afford to pay for internet, free internet because it owned car trading magazines that made it a lot of money. Then it sold those car trading magazines and it got into a private equity fund. Now it is getting through its money faster than the Chinese government is getting through its foreign exchange reserves or the Saudi government, so it will run out. But there will still be pockets of money that will pay for free information. So uh, I don't think that we should pretend that there is any one single formula that's going to come. I think that your, your, your kind of uh, ownership gives us a, 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 for, a certain authority based on who your owner is in that, in, in that case, and that is a virtue in itself. Uh, but subscription publications will compete with you, hopefully, for just the verifiability and the different, the different distinction that they bring. Anyone who has something that they must say and cannot sleep at night unless they do so? Well, uh, just one sentence on, on Japanese and watchdog journalism. Uh, I've, uh, uh, I have dealings with the uh, Essex Human Rights Center and uh, their Japan expert, uh, their San Sanai, uh, Fukuda, uh, not Fukuda, uh, wrote after the, the episode of the uh, anchor, the TV anchors being removed, saying, uh, in her estimation, that the J Japanese journalists have forgotten uh, how to do watchdog journalism, how to hold power to account. And it just happened that 10 days ago, I had an event at the Daiwa Anglo-Japanese Foundation in London with the former head of Gigi Digital, and uh, he said that, the, in his view, he's now out of it, uh, Japanese journalists covering politics and so on are uh, prone uh, to being uh, allying themselves, the so-called yuchaku collusion, uh, with the uh, sources of their stories to such an extent that they uh, have lost their independence. If you look at the failures uh, to report um, company, um, uh, falsified company, uh, accounts, reports, and uh, the Olympus scandal, and so on. Uh, there is a trail of failed investigation here, and watching Japanese TV, I mean, it's hard to imagine anything more like uh, baby powder uh, than their coverage of, of news. Uh, so I don't, I think, mean, if you don't see, if you don't see uh, politicians squirming, if, you, if they refuse to answer questions, which is happening in Turkey, and it's happening apparently in Japan, uh, you know that press freedom is not happening. Well, on that uplifting note, thank you. Uh, uh, well, uh, we can continue this discussion very easily because uh, in keeping with our club's custom, uh, anyone who uh, subjects himself or herself to, to this kind of treatment gets an honorary membership for a year. Oh, so we have to so, come back. So <laughs> you and you can, of course, come back tonight. Uh, there's going to be a, um, a, a small uh, gathering uh, you do have to register yourself, and there is a limit to the numbers. So, but if you, you can come back and say hello to your friends and ask those questions, which, you, which I did not allow you to uh, ask this time. Uh, it's, it's going to be this evening. Anyway, thank, thank you to all four of you uh, for sharing your experience and wisdom with us, and also thanks to all the questioners for very stimulating questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.